Hey, g'day, it's Prezo here, welcome back. This is part two of Metal Finishing with Mark. The topic of today's uh, tutorial, if you like to call it that, is a process called engine turning, also sometimes known as dueling. Now, this is a decorative process used on metal and the most common place you would see it is on uh, scientific instruments. You might also find it on the dashboards of some classic cars and uh, probably the most prominent example I could find was on the cowling, the engine cowling of the Spirit of St. Louis, which was Lindbergh's famous aircraft. And uh, that aircraft and replicas still exist and if you get up close to it, you'll see that process used on that engine cowling. I need to back up a little bit. I was looking at an Instagram post by a gentleman named Steve Smith some time ago. He was making a bandsaw table, or well, he fabricated his, and he put that engine turning process on the surface of the table. Now this is one that I cast uh, for a metal cutting bandsaw that I was working on. When I looked at what Steve had done, I thought, you know what, <laughs> I'd love to have a go at that. And uh, you should check out Steve's uh, Instagram account. He's working on uh, one of those beautiful uh, all-chin traction engines. Uh, it's one of the, the classic traction engines uh, built by model engineers. And I've taken to calling him Rivet Man because <laughs> he's posting pictures of uh, the riveting process used on the hind wheels of this traction engine and they said about you know 11 million rivets to be done in those uh, wheels but he's doing a fantastic job so uh, check him out uh, he does some amazing work but when i saw what steve was doing i got in touch with him i said do you mind if i shamelessly steal that idea for my bandsaw table he said no go ahead so uh, that's what i'm going to do so i want to demonstrate a method that i use uh, for engine turning uh, now there are lots of ways of doing this and the you know the way I'm doing these tutorials is to show you what I do in the home shop. Now it's not probably the best way, it's certainly uh, not always the easiest way, but it's a method that I think is going to give me a, a really good look on this table. Now I know this is going to attract criticism from people because they will say, uh, well, it's a bandsaw table, it's going to get scratched as soon as you use it. And yes, I know that, but Who's going to have the best looking bandsaw table? So this is what engine turning looks like. Uh, I've done this on a piece of stainless steel and typically what you do is you get an abrasive pad, usually something relatively soft, certainly softer than the, the material that you're going to be working on. And then you simply put the pattern on in repeating rows and repeated spaces. Now you can do this entirely by eye and that's how I did this one here. I just eyeballed the uh, rows and the spacing between the patterns. Right, to make this work you need some sort of abrasive material. Now the one I've used for that small pattern was uh, this one here, it's called Kratex. And Kratex is a rubberized abrasive material. You can buy this in cylindrical sticks, but I have a set of these as points that you can fit onto a mandrel. And these fit into a Dremel. Uh, but I put mine in the drill chuck, my drill press, and I just simply dabbed, I suppose that's the correct technical term for it, just dab it down onto the surface and then shift the pattern as you go. Now these are expensive, that's the only thing. You can do this with like a wooden dowel uh, if you're careful. You'd need to be a little bit selective about your choice of wood though. You'd want something with a fairly fine even grain, something like beech would be good. And then you need some sort of abrasive material. Now just about anything would do. I've heard that toothpaste, brasso, carburetor powder, garnet, any of those sort of abrasives will work. The only thing is that this little Kratex point here is quite small and I need to do quite a large area and it would just simply take too long to do it this way. Now this one here is aluminium. Uh, the diameter of that pattern there is 38 millimeters and that sort of divides fairly evenly into the size of the table that I'm working on. Now once again you can eyeball this and uh, when I saw what Steve Smith had done on his bandsaw table he had just simply drawn a series of parallel lines at 90 degrees apart and he used that as a guide for his uh, abrasive pad as he put it down onto the material. And that works, absolutely, that, that's, that's good enough. <laughs> you certainly don't need to go to the extent that I'm going to go to. But uh, I, I don't know, I just like exploring different ways of doing things. So we'll look at the setup in a minute. Okay, that brings us to the next point. What do we use for a pad, an abrasive pad, when we're working at this size? 
So what Steve used was just good old Scotch Bright, and I think he said he stole one from underneath his wife's sink. And uh, you can then attach that to some sort of a mandrel. And I think he, he just stuck it on with um, some sort of glue. And I tried that and it does work, but I find that this is a little bit too coarse and it gives you a very aggressive grind on uh, especially aluminium. So I started looking at some options uh, rather than using the scotch Bright. Right, what I came up with was a steel mandrel. I just turned this up on the lathe. Like I say, the diameter of that head there is about 38 millimeters diameter. And I wanted uh, something that would carry a fine abrasive rather than something coarse. And in the end, I decided on using pumice. Now you can buy pumice powder. Um, I you can buy it from chemists, I believe. Um, I think it's used in podiatry and that sort of thing for removing dead skin. I got mine online. I think I bought it on eBay and I bought like half a kilo, which is tons. Now, <laughs> should mention I bought it for French polishing, not for working on my scaly old feet. But what we need to do now is work out a way of carrying that pumice when we're working on the, the parent metal. Now, I've decided to use cork and I can attach that cork to that steel uh, mandrel there using glue. The glue that I've chosen to use is hot glue. And there's a technique for doing this which is interesting. If you just get your hot glue gun and you put the glue straight onto that steel disc there, it will chill almost straight away. So by the time you attach your cork to it, it's already formed a hard interface against the steel and it'll stick to the cork okay, but it'll just peel off the steel. So what we need to do is use uh, some way of keeping the glue liquid on that steel mandrel while we get the cork on there. So let's have a look at that. So here's the deal, I've got to glue that piece of cork on top of that steel face there. And like I say, using a hot glue gun really doesn't work very well. So an alternate is to heat that steel up to the melting point of the hot glue stick. Smear it on and then put your cork straight on top and put a weight on it to hold it till it cools. And this works great. <laughs> so let's get this hot. So I just want to heat that disc up a little bit. I'm just using an LPG or a propane torch here. Have your glue stick handy. Just keep trying your glue stick until you can see it's starting to melt, cover the surface. Now this will carry enough residual heat to keep that hot glue film liquid until you get the cork to bond to it. Alright, you can see that glue stick going on there quite well now. So get a good coating on it and then just give it a little bit more heat to smooth it out or level it. And now you've got time to work. Don't be in a terrible hurry, just make sure your piece of cork is clean. Put that on there. And I'm just going to put this down on the bench. Basically that's it. So we're going to let that cool. Um, if you're really worried about it, you can put some weight on top of that or clamp it. But uh, I don't think it's necessary in this case. So I let the cork over size. I'm going to trim all that later. And the reason we're using cork is that it's soft and resilient. It's also going to pick up and absorb whatever abrasive material you put on the surface of your material. Now pumice is good because it's, uh, it's very fine. It embeds quite well into the cork. And the other thing is that uh, if that, for any reason, if that surface is not completely flat and level, you can dress the cork and get it level before you start working on your part. It also means that you can periodically renew and recharge the surface with fresh abrasive. And that's one of the critical things about engine turning is you need to have a consistent pattern 
especially if you're doing a large surface. The last thing you want is to get part way through and then find out that your abrasive is starting to uh, disappear or dissipate or it gets too aggressive or it just, it, you know, the pattern looks different and then you're in trouble. So let's let that cool and we'll go on to the next step. This is the rig that I'm using for uh, positioning my material as I do this um, engine turning pattern. Now I've set this up on my little CNC milling machine. The main reason for that is that I can get the correct distance between the spindle and the column to enable me to do the full pattern in the Y direction. My drill press wasn't quite big enough. I just didn't have the reach between the spindle and the, the round column. Now, of course, if you've got a great big bridge port or something like that, well, <laughs> you're fine. You don't need to worry about it. Uh, but if you've got a smaller machine, then it can be a bit of a stretch to do a, a piece that size. Now, of course, it all depends on the size of your workpiece, whether that's going to be a problem or not. The most important thing is that you have a way of aligning the spindle and keeping the spindle square to the work. If you try and do this with a handheld cordless drill, chances are it's going to tip sideways and it's going to skid off um, over your material and ruin the pattern. So certainly a, you know, a drill press or a milling machine or something like that would be the best solution. Now the other thing I've done here is I've got a piece of particle board clamped down to the bed of the mill and I put a fence down one side here so I can align the work and slide it in the Y direction and then I can just simply move the table of my mill across the 28 millimeter spacing that I want. Now once again, you don't need to do that. You could just simply unclamp the whole table, move it 28 millimeters, clamp it down again and go that way. And of course you still have the option of just simply guiding it freehand. But the, the marks on here are positioned either side of center. So I worked out the exact center of my table in this position here. I've set that at zero, zero on my cam software. And then I've got the 28 millimeter marks either side of center. And this line here is the full width of the table at 240 millimeters. So I'm going to have uh, a bit less than a full pattern coming out to that edge. But that's okay as long as it overlaps all the way around. Okay, well this is me just being pedantic here, but what I did was I drew the uh, black square there to represent the size of the table at 240 millimeters square. I've got an exact center at this point here. And each of those magenta circles represents the 38 millimeter abrasive pad. And the trick is to get the offset uh, so that you don't end up with any patches that haven't been treated by the abrasive. And you don't want too small an offset because then you tend to obliterate the pattern as you go. And if you go too big, of course, you're gonna leave patches that don't get treated. You can see that what you end up with is this little triangular shape here, which is the, the overlap of all the patterns. The other important thing to remember is in my case, I'm offsetting by 28 millimeters for a 38 diameter abrasive pad. And when you offset in the Y direction, you go the full 38 in the Y, and then half of that or 14 millimeters in the X, so that you stagger the pattern as you go. And I worked it out that uh, for the dimensions that I'm using there, the ratio for the offset or the percentage for the offset is 73.8. Now that should work regardless of the diameter of the abrasive pad that you're using. So if you're looking to do this yourself, uh, just take the diameter of your abrasive, uh, work out 73 or you know, it can be 72, 74%, something like that. And that should give you an appropriate amount of offset. That hot glue is cooled down now so I can go around and trim this. It's gonna do this roughly. Now the cork that I'm using here is just one of those old cork floor tiles and you could use uh, like a hard felt or rubber uh, or even like a balsa wood might work. You just want something that's sort of relatively soft and resilient. It's got to be able to compress and conform to the shape that you're working on. So I'm going to mount this in a cordless drill now and just trim it up and make it perfectly circular. If you don't have a fixed belt sander like I've got here, you could use a portable belt sander, you could use an old file just clamped in the vise or some coarse sandpaper and that would do. 
So what we're going to do now is mount this in the spindle of the machine and we're going to dress that cork and make sure it's dead flat. So I've got that in the chuck of the spindle and I push it right up against the bottom of the jaws there so it can't be pushed up any further. And I've got a piece of uh, 100 grit sandpaper and I want to stretch that out on this piece of chipboard and then I'm going to lower the cork onto that and just dress that cork and make sure it's dead flat. Now this is one thing I found is really important. If the shape that you were trying to press down onto your workpiece is in any way convex then you'll tend to get a grind pattern in the center and nothing at the edges so it won't be the full diameter that you're looking for. If it's not level, as soon as you touch it on the work it'll skid off sideways. So this step is probably the most critical of the whole process really apart from your spacing. So let's give this a go. So that's sort of all it needs. Uh, if you want to be sure that you've got it flat, one way of doing that would be to get a pencil and just draw some marks across there and then repeat that process. If the pencil marks are all gone, you know you've got it flat. And don't go to town with this, you don't want to wear your cork out <laughs> before you've done the job. Keep that sandpaper handy because you can use that to dress the cork as you go. So you can see that all the pencil marks are gone now, so we know that's flat, so we can get on with our patterning. Now, the abrasive that I'm using here is called pumice. Uh, it's just ground up uh, pumice powder. And the grade that I'm using is triple F, which I think stands for fine. And it works great. Uh, it's not so coarse that it, it scratches deeply, but it gives you that beautiful circular pattern. And if you want to check that it's going to work okay and it's the sort of texture that you're looking for, just get a bit of scrap. And all I do is I just sprinkle a bit of the pumice on that surface there. I was watching a video uh, that Tubal Kane did uh, where he got one of his mates around and they were doing some of this uh, engine turning process. And they were using oil and carborundum or valve grinding paste, uh, which works. It, it's absolutely fine, but it tends to get a little bit messy. This stuff here... Uh, you know, it's powdery. Uh, if you're worried about getting it on your machine, you need to drape your machine and make sure it doesn't get into the, the waves and the, the working surfaces. But this stuff is, it's just like flour. So let's try this out. Okay, so there it is there. These ones on the other side I did yesterday. That's it now, just with a freshly dressed cork. Now one of the reasons you might want to try it on the scrap is that it gets some of that pumice powder into the cork and sort of gets it ready for working on your finished part. Uh, if you do this for the first time, the pumice may not be fully embedded into the surface of the cork. And that was the very first one that I did. And you see it didn't quite get out to the edge but the subsequent ones are fine. So do get a bit of scrap, try it out first, make sure you got the cork charged with the abrasive before you go on. So at least that's a nice even texture before we go on to the engine turning. Okay, I tried doing this table with the pumice and it's uh, fair to say it was a failure really. I don't know what went wrong, it worked perfectly on this aluminium sheet. When I tried on the cast material it just came out dull, it was badly defined and I was very disappointed with it. So I did a small patch up in this corner, I've cleaned that off and I'm going to have a go now using this stuff. This is uh, valve grinding paste uh, or an oil borne carborundum powder and I'm using the fine uh, grinding paste on this. So uh, I've once again tried that out and it looks good. So the question is can I keep a you know, uniform look to this as I go? So I think I'm going to attack it this way. So what we'll do now is offset the table of the, the mill and we'll start our first row down here. <coughs> So 
So I'm going to put the, the paste I think directly onto the metal. And I'll put up put up there as well. All right, let's give it a try. Trouble is, it's hard to tell until you clean it off, but it's looking okay. Let's just keep going. Do the next row. Alright, we'll clean that off, see how we went. I doused that with kerosene and then some liquid detergent trying to wash off all of that abrasive rather than sort of scrub it with a paper towel because so that would drag the abrasive and ruin that finish. But look, that looks like it belongs in a disco, doesn't it? <laughs> it's too good for a bandsaw. But uh, look, just, just for a bit of fun, let's try a fully automated CNC engine turning process on a piece of stock just yeah just for fun Woohoo! so here's the deal i've got a piece of three millimeter thick stainless steel double sided tape down to a piece of chipboard clamp all that up i've set my origin at this corner here and i've got the cratex point in the drill chuck and i've set up a uh, machining program that will go along and just simply put all of the the little spots on it so this is just a bit of fun <laughs> um, Expect that things won't go the way I plan it, but uh, let's let's see what happens. All right. Um, now this could end in disaster.
Wow, well you look at that. <laughs> That's amazing. Let's have a closer look. Just gave that a bit of a clean with some uh, alcohol just to get rid of the, uh, the, the debris that was on the surface there. And I am <laughs> incredibly surprised that that worked. I imagined that the Kratex was going to wear down and by the time we got to the end of the pattern it would have been not the same as the start but it seems to have held up really well. So I set the depth of cut to be 0.3 of a millimeter and I drew up all my geometry in my CAM software and just told it to do a CAN cycle and um, if you had to do a really big pattern I'd imagine you need to build in some sort of uh, increase in the depth of cut as you went along just to account for the wear. There's probably some fancy g-code that will do that for you. But uh, that looks absolutely amazing. So uh, yeah, I'm happy with that and happy with this too. And I'm gonna finish up the video here now. Next time we're gonna be doing anodizing and I've got a little trick up my sleeve to finish this off. Just to gild the lily a bit, <laughs> as they say. So uh, join me for that and uh, you should get down to your workshop and do some of this stuff too uh, because let's face it who really wants to go outside at the moment okay espresso signing out i'll catch you on the next video thanks for watching